Almost two years ago, I made a video about fire marks. Back in the 18th century, firefighters in London were funded by insurance companies. When you insured a building, you would be given a fire mark, a big plaque to put on the front. And if a fire ever broke out, all the various companies' firefighters would rush to the scene. And the story goes that they would look at the building and only fight the fire if they saw their company's mark, or the mark of a company that they had an agreement with. If the building wasn't insured, they would let it burn. This is a really well-known story in Britain. It's part of the standard history of the fire brigades. Panel show QI has talked about it. If you hadn't paid, they wouldn't put your fire oh, out. Whatever. Unless you <laughs> happened to be next to someone else who had. Children's TV show Horrible Histories did a whole sketch on it, including the host, a talking rat, holding up a sign that says, they really did this. And the sources I used for my video included the history page on the London Fire Brigade Museum's own website. This was not controversial. Now, soon after publication, I was told about one embarrassing error in the video. The plaques I filmed weren't actually fire marks. There's no list of all the surviving marks anywhere, but I found stock photos of some marks with locations attached, and I figured, great, I can, I can just film there. But those captions are wrong. Whoever wrote them was completely mistaken. Apparently those are parish boundary markers. Which is not great, but it's the sort of thing that I can fix by pinning a correction. It doesn't affect whether the main part of the video is true. But about a month ago, I got an email that was like, you know that source you use, the, the London Fire Brigade Museum's page? It doesn't say that. And it doesn't. The page has been changed. And it now says there is little real evidence to suggest that this was the case. So I was straight off into a rabbit hole of research because this was exactly on a weird borderline in my head. At times I was like, well, actually that makes no sense when you think about it. No one would let a fire burn if they were standing there with water. It's got to be an urban legend. And then I'd switch to, well, there were many more cruel things going on in that century. Heck, there still are. There are places in the world where that system exists today. It's summed up as no pay, no spray. And it seemed like every source I read had a slightly different opinion. I couldn't find any actual testimonials from the time, and the secondary and tertiary sources that I had access to didn't go into any depth. Most of them just briefly stated it as an unreferenced fact and said no more. I'm on the road right now, so I can't go into archives, and even if I could, I wouldn't know where to start. So. I hired an experienced professional archives research consultant. My brief was simple. Is the story true? Answering that took the consultant two weeks of work. Not two weeks of undergrad slacking off time, I mean two solid weeks of eight-hour workdays, including visiting the British Library to check documents that haven't been digitised yet. He's put together a thoroughly referenced report. I've linked it down in the description. And now, I'm going to summarise his summary in about 60 seconds. Here we go. Through the 18th century, fire marks were an indicator of whether a building was insured, but the general policy of London insurance companies was that their firefighters did try to fight all fires, whether insured or not. Three reasons why. One, a fire in an uninsured building can easily spread to an insured property or dozens of insured properties. Economically, it made sense to cut the problem off as early as possible. Two, it is really good advertising to have smartly dressed firefighters rushing in to save the day. And three, it was the right thing to do. There are good references from the time to back all that up. But by 1721, there were eight fire insurance officers in London. We don't know how many actual fire brigades there were, but there were enough for there to be rivalries between them. And there was also a law that gave reward money to the first, second and third brigades to attend a fire. That's one of the reasons they raced to fires so fast. They got paid more if they did. So sometimes too many firefighters would turn up. They couldn't all help and there might not be enough firefighting water for all of them. Many of those firefighters were recruited from being watermen on the River Thames, rough and ready ferry workers. So if they weren't quick enough and they missed out on the reward, and it wasn't a building insured by their company anyway, they might just stand back, jeer a bit, or worst case, maybe even interfere with the folks who were going to get the reward money instead of them. That is, in the researchers' view, the most probable place that the story came from. There are so many more subtleties than that, this is not certain. History is fractal, and you can always, always find more detail if you keep looking. We're summarising more than 150 years here. But, big picture, did some firefighters ever stand back and let a building burn? Yes, it probably did happen, but there's no evidence from the time to show it was ever an official standard policy for insurance fire brigades in 18th century London. I was wrong. QI was wrong. Horrible histories was wrong. Hundreds, maybe thousands of pop history books and storytellers were wrong. We think. 
If any history students are looking for a PhD topic, it feels like you could get three years of research out of this and still not end up with a definitive yes or no. It's a perfect example of how quickly and how badly even big, important stories can become muddled. And how the study of history is not about memorising dates, it's about the interpretation of really messy, patchy data. So, I have pulled my original video. It's unlisted now, I've put a link in the description here for posterity, but YouTube won't ever recommend it. It won't show up in search results, and I've put a big warning on it. Also, turns out I made another error anyway, I said the wrong organisation name later on in the video. As ever, you shouldn't trust me. Sometimes I blunder. Sometimes I am standing on the shoulders of mistaken giants. Anyone who tells you they're certain about how the world works is either a mathematician, or they're selling something. Like this video sponsor, NordVPN. Really, it is sponsored. I'm finding them incredibly useful. I'm not going to be home for Christmas, but my internet connection can be. Lots of websites and apps block international traffic or redirect it. They think they're being clever. They think they're helping some international user. But I'm actually abroad trying to order Christmas presents from Britain for people in Britain. So it's really annoying. That's not some made-up example. One site just kept bouncing me to .com instead of .co.uk, but now I can click NordVPN's magic button that lets me say I'm back in the UK, or in any one of about 60 other countries, and suddenly I get shown price in pounds sterling and shipping options that take less than two weeks. You could also access other content that's region blocked, just check the terms of service first. One subscription is enough for up to six devices across Windows, Mac, Linux, iOS and Android. There's a 30-day money-back guarantee and you can bundle in their password manager NordPass. If you go to nordvpn.com slash tomscott you'll find the best deal they're currently offering, even if it's well past Christmas when you're watching this. Merry Christmas everyone.